І от кожен день ти от прокидаєшся, тобі дуже страшно, бо це як лотерея. Ти будеш жити завтра, чи ти помреш завтра. Он говорит то, что все украинцы хохлы, кастрюли, фашисты. Russia destroying Ukrainian cities, killing, abducting and torturing civilians. Russia does not even hide the fact that it has evacuated 744,000 Ukrainian children. However, this is not an evacuation, not even a deportation, it's a kidnapping. Ukraine has officially identified less than 20,000 Ukrainian children abducted by Russia. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian girls and boys, in fact, are held captive by Putin's regime. And on playgrounds like this, instead of children's laughter, air raid alerts are heard. Kids play on the playground, they ran to me and showed on the phone. They said, Mom, look, Russian tanks are moving along the highway. I did not believe that. There was a whole column of military equipment rides and we thought, why is the highway humming? There was such a roar, the ground felt like it was shaking. I look at the phone, tanks with Z signs were coming. There was a whole column of them coming down the road. It was very scary to watch. They started stealing from the stores. If they were closed at night, they needed alcohol and cigarettes. They asked people what drugs were sold. Our people were intimidated. A lot of people started to leave. There was a moment when a convoy of people started to leave and the whole column was shot on the Kherson highway. 30 cars, I think, were shot and a lot of people died there and got hurt. And after that, people got scared and stayed in Borislav. They did absolutely everything that no one could leave. I live in the Kherson city of Selo Kisilivka. We went with a dad to go to the house. І якраз їдуть окупанти, і вони зупиняються, перевіряють телефони. Побачили ті окупанти, що ми переписувалися з українськими військовими, забрали нас на заправку, побили нас там по почкам, по лиці, потім кинули там на яму, там де свинячі чи якісь там кишки були. Два часа ми там побули, вражали, що кин... гранату кинете, кинемо в яму за рим, застрелимо у вас. Вона кинула мішок, за тяжко ми зав'язали натягли руки і повезли, закинули в бубік автомобіль, повезли нас в Херсон. Я просив, щоб, щоб я зв'язався з батьками, вони мені не давали. School didn't start, we went to the principal. She says, you see what the situation is. There is a war going on. What school are you talking about? Let the children go. We decided in the white administration that children will go to a camp. Why do they need to see all this? Let them go. We've already settled and signed everything. Your job is just to bring the kids here tomorrow at 5 o'clock in the morning. Pack as little as possible. They'll be there dressed. Everything will be all right. Yes, we decided to go. I said, OK. When we came in, she showed us a sheet of paper and said, sign here, it's already done for you. Don't worry, two weeks, they will bring them back. They will be dressed. And generally speaking, what is your Ukraine? What did they give you? You have to give money for the school. You give money for everything. You just put your wallet for the school and they will give you everything. They will come and go to school at no cost, she said. Russia's abduction of children from Ukraine is a well-planned and well-organized process in the best traditions of KGB operations. Typical scenarios are used – deception or murder of parents, abduction of orphans, deportation under the pretext of health improvement, filtration camps and selection of the strongest. 
Is it worth saying that Russia has a well-planned genocidal policy towards Ukrainian children and the implementation of this policy did not begin now, during the full-scale invasion? It started back in 2014 when the Russian annexed Crimea and immediately afterwards launched the so-called train of hope that brought Russian citizens to the annexed Crimea to illegally adopt Ukrainian children. Now the Russians have a wider range of methods, ways and situations in which they abduct Ukrainian children. And accordingly, they have a larger territory now that they have temporarily occupied. Their 369 children we managed to return and their stories that we studied after their return allowed us to analyze the actions of the invaders against Ukrainian children. We have already analyzed at least five abduction scenarios and now we are already investigating the sixth scenario. They first kill the parents and then abduct the children. This is the story, for example, of Kira and Ilya, who were the first to be returned, whose parents died right in the front of them. Kira's father went to fetch water and died right in front of her. And Ilya's mother died in his arms, having been shot in head. The second scenario is when Russians remove children directly from their biological families. They often deprive parents of their parental rights, inconvenient parents who do not want to cooperate with the occupation authorities. So they are deprived of parental right and children are taken away. The third scenario is when Russians separate children from their parents during the so-called filtration procedure. There is a well-known case of Mr. Yevhen and his three children, also from Mariupol, who were separated during the filtration procedure. But then Yevhen managed to get free and took his three children from the Russian Federation. Literally a few days before, they were to be sent to a foster family with Russians. My name is Sasha, I'm 12 years old. I am in the last year of the year I am looking for my mom. My name is Kozlova Snežana Mikhailovna. Нас розлучили в фільтраційному табірі в селі Безимино. Росіяни говорили, що я мамі не потрібен, що, що віддадуть в приємну сім'ю в Росії. Уявіть, вони навіть не дали мені попрощатися з мамою. The fourth case is when the Russians create conditions that are completely unsuitable for children to live in on the temporarily occupied territories. And the fifth scenario is perhaps the most widespread, when because of such an uninhabitable conditions parents allegedly voluntarily, but in fact it is not voluntarily, give their children to Russian camps, signing documents for so-called rest, from which they are supposed to return the child in two or three weeks, according to the documents. But of course, the child is not returned. They stayed there for six months or a year. There are children whom we managed to return a year after such camps, because children are shuffled from one camp to another and so on. This rehabilitation and camping take place in all the occupied territories. Children from all these territories are sent to Crimea for rehabilitation. That is within the occupied territories, but also on the territory Krasnodar Krai to Anapa in particular. But there are also cases, individual testimonies, where they are sent much further away, for example, to Magadan. We know the places where Ukrainian children are, where they are moved. There were three places. A fourth has already appeared. Three in the Minsk region, one in the Homel region, specific names, organizations, founders, foundations, the Russian Dolphins Foundation, the Belarusian Talaya Foundation, we know that they get into the territory of Ukraine. They're engaged in the removal of Ukrainian children. Currently, there is a mass removal of children from the Zaporizhia region happening. Over the past week, more than a thousand children from families. They are also sent to so-called rehabilitation. Yet we do not have the information where they get moved. This camp is really justified by rest, rehabilitation and, again, by saving them from shelling, that children need to be given a break from this difficult situation. Firstly, this is how pressure is put on parents, like they are so bad parents who do not want to send their children to a place where they will have a good rest and will not listen to the shelling all the time. We gave at 5 a.m. with our bags, that woman brought out the papers already on the run. 
She was putting everything in and I asked, where to? When can I get in touch with him? She said, you will, don't worry. Перед школой каждый день была, так сказать, линейка, и заставляли стоять под русский гимн. А там не спрашивают, кто заставляет. Объяснительно или в изоляторе закроют. Мы сидели в лагере две недели уже в этом. Нам типа говорят, вы сейчас не сможете выехать, там сейчас эвакуация в Херсоне идет, там обстрелы, там типа граница закрыта, то автобусы дорого. Either there are no lists, then something else, and each God's day, some new story. Every day, he said, tomorrow, tomorrow, we will gather things. Like, we gathered things. He said, where did you gather things? You don't go anywhere. We are sent to another camp, to another camp. We are attached to the camp. We are on the bridge of the Kalucha Probalka. We are saying, for what? Like, Probalka. They say, like, there are all kinds of birds, and dogs can kill. We are so high. We didn't have any light, no gas, no water. Ми стояли коло мангала, готували їжу, тому що вдома неможливо було готувати. Та потім почався обстріл. Я почув вибух, мене оглушило. І потім я відчув, що в мене щось пече. Я відчув... Гарячі такі, наче уламоки. Я кричав мамі, що в мене болить око, що в мене пече. Мама швидко мене відвела між гаражами, ми заховалися. Переждали обстріл. Потім ми з мамою шукали медичної допомоги, щоб вилікувати моє око. Пішли на завод Іліча. Там були військові медики. Вони обробили око і ми... Сталися з ними на заводі, а вже на заводі закінчились боєприпаси і нас всіх взяли в полон. Російські військові нас посадили в КАМАЗи, як якихось тварин, і відвезли в якийсь ангар. Я сидів в фільтраційному таборі, чекав маму декілька годин, а її так привели, навіть не дали попрощатися. Та сказали, що мене від мами забирають. В інтернет відвезуть і там вже мене знають. Мене прийме російська сім'я. The Russians are constantly moving Ukrainian children across Russia, Chechnya, Crimea and even Belarus to make it harder to find them. Wherever the Russian Federation takes our children, the main goal remains to impose the ideology of the Russian world and destroy Ukrainian identity. The Russians want to bring all Ukrainian children into the status of the Ukrainian ethnic group and the Russian Federation. To do this, they changed the legislation and Putin personally signed two acts, one in May 2022 and the other in May 2013. In the first, he simplified the procedure for the adoption of Ukrainian children by Russian families as much as possible. The second act he signed was signed in December 2022, in which he effectively recognized all children living in the temporarily occupied territory of Ukraine who are under the age of 14 as Russian children. In fact, he has already committed a war crime, genocide, by his actions. Lvova Belova publicly said that I adopted a Ukrainian child. This fact alone is a completed crime. What are our children? What you mentioned? When there are ideological families, they try to reconfigure these children. Children's minds under the age of 28, especially teenagers, are like plasticine and can be simply molded. Whatever you tell a child, you can deceive them. Russians are very fond of doing this. Their technology is very good in information warfare. We know that they are being re-educated, re-educated, they change their mentally. They are told that both Biden and Zelensky should even be liquidated and that there is no legitimate power in Ukraine, that it is usurped power, that is, they are being worked on methodically and systematically. 
propagandists, so-called artists from Lukashenko's pool, paramilitary children's organizations, Night Wolves, a well-known Russian organization. That is, they process and process Ukrainian children. Why do they kidnap children? There are several approaches to the development of the country. There is an approach when we develop technologies and automate everything. Then a lot of people are not needed because robots do everything. And there is a methodology for obtaining some kind of knowledge product and so on. And there are countries that are guided by the old approach, the more people, the more taxes, the more resources, and so on. Russia, in fact, is guided by this old approach of the number of people. Which is why it abducts children to increase its population. Now when we see such data, we can only be afraid and hope that they will, at least, be physically protected. At the very least, because you cannot imagine what types of human trafficking are in general. It's not just the physical abduction, it's also zombifying children, it's involving them in begging, because involving children in begging is kind of like a whole mafia. We have facts when they promise to educate Ukrainian children on the territory of Belarus and subsequently offer them to work for Belaruskal as minors. In other words, this is, excuse me, slavery. This is the use of children as a labor force. Lukashenko signed all these documents, very curiously, in Moscow. Strange as it may seem, there is nothing new in this. We know from history a lot of wars in which the enemy behaved in the same way. When they took children, the hard-working population, in general who could work for the enemy. When it comes to children, there are several reasons for this. One of the reasons is to put them into a state of deprivation. In the psychoanalytical sense, and relatively speaking, there's even the concept of castration of the adult population in general. So it's very difficult to talk about this topic, because it really is, as you say, a failure of the European and international community. In my opinion, the whole political society of the world should be involved in the fact that they cannot agree and take the children away. Я потрапив в полон 8 квітня 2022 року у вісі 16 років та бурав, перебував в полоні рівно 90 днів. Ми великою акційною колоною з цивільних машин, там було дуже багато, може бути десь 100, ми виїжджали до Запоріжжя з Мелітополя. Він вивів мене з машини, наставив на мене автомат та запитав мене, чи мені тебе розстріляти прямо зараз, чи розбити твій телефон. Я ну, дуже сильно закався, бо це були не придаваємо емоції, тому що ти розумієш, що тебе там зараз можуть розстріляти, просто ну, буквально не за що. Я зрозумів, що я в полоні тільки, коли, тільки тоді, коли мене посадили в військовий грузовик під охороною, я відвезли в садзо. Мені відвели одиночну камеру, вона була дуже маленька. Ця камера була буквально 3 на 2 метри, там було дуже сильно ехо. І якщо там у самому глибині там когось катували, там десь біля, ну, за моєю камерою так, метр так, 4-5. А, от це було чутно, як бути біля мене катували. І от кожен день ти от прокидаєшся, то тобі дуже страшно, бо це як лотерея. Ти будеш жити завтра, чи ти помреш завтра. Спочатку нас одну камеру посадили, там, де ми разом були, маленька така була, зелена, там, де решетки ще були, стальні двері. Потім ми знову зав'язали очі, мішок накинули, і ми зайшли тоді в підвал вже, а там вже було холодно. Перші чотири дні я взагалі не їв. Нам давали в день дві ложки макарон, дві ложки гречки. Заводять по кімнатам, в кімнатах, типу, як цемент, там просто три, три кроваті, навіть вещі нема куди положити. Вони кажуть, ви на території України будете дзвонити, якщо подзвоните, відбираємо телефони. І не розговарювати на українському, тільки на русському, ви будете жити в Росії. Я тільки в одвечірку в кімнаті нікого нема, типу, дзвонив мамі, вже узнавав, що там, і казав, що відбувається. У нас зібрати вже ми йдемо як їсти, 
это уже как 12 часов. Там на спать нам кашу одну. Была маленькие порции давали. То есть половина детей даже не наедалась. Там Хорошо. были котлеты, будто с, хат, э, с отходов какие-то. Потом плохо после него. Потом плохо, тошнило. И, в принципе, безопаснее было ничего не было. Встречай нас Астахов, вот сай, Валерий Васильевич. Типа, кажи, идем, ты поговорим. Заводы нас как в подвал. Типа, мы говорим, зачем тут, если можно было бы тут поговорить. Он нас и обзывал по дороге, пока мы еще туда, типа. Он говорит, что вы там и больны, начиная заводы нас говорят. Что вы сбегаете? А моя подруга говорит, мы хотим есть, мы типа голодные, вы нас не можете нормально покормить, вы тут и нас и унижаете, и всякое такое. Мы начинаем говорить, он говорит, нет, вы там просто что-то накрутили себе, вы больны на голову, вы типа домой не вернетесь, в детдом вас отправим. The network is actually very large, as is the whole system and the state policy of Russia. It starts with officials, representatives and the state Duma. There were evidences that the deputy prime minister of Russia is involved, and also certain governors of some regions, in particular the governor of Krasnodar region, in the so-called camping of children from Kharkiv region, the pilot region in which the movement of children from Ukraine and the placement in families began was the Moscow region. The heads of this region are Andrei Vorobyov and Vyacheslav Dukhov. In addition, these are, of course, the leaders of so-called DNR and LNR, who are fully discussed and arranged this entire process with Russian officials. This is Pushilin in person. We saw that this tyranny and racism does to children. They steal children only to re-educate them, to turn them into obedient bio-robots that they can later use for their own purposes. Today, those children who fall under their influence really have changes in their psychology, in their mental states. They will need to be helped afterwards, compensating and brought back to freedom to liberty, to the spirit that we Ukrainians have. We started to do what we were doing, what we were doing in the basement. We started to speak the word of Ukraine there. And yes, there was a group of children who were gathered against them, so that they would take us home. I said, when they would take us home, they said, they would take us home already. They would live in Russia. As he said, I heard something that we would do like for Ukraine, something that would be like for Ukraine, something that would be наказание будет. Потом він до нас подходит, начинает нас обзывать опять. Он говорил то, что все украинцы хохлы, кастрюли, фашисты, фашисты назвал нас. Завода нас в изолятор, в изолятор там, як, там, где лечились дети, ну типа сидел кто заболел. Есть такой изолятор, там, где просто без окон, просто сидишь. Ну. Мы там просидели 4 дня уже. Потом выходим уже как под вечер. Выходим, как раз был разговор о важном, нас собирают опять. Каждый день у нас там був, так і там розказували нам, що Росія така могуча, там, що Україна не що там, Зеленський, нар... да, Зеленський наркоман, там і згорить Україна. Удари палкою железною, те, що у нас типу, сказали слово Україні, йде, типу, мальчика, вона йому типу, говорить слово Україні. А він, типу, вроді би, чи Суганська, чи откуди весь був, я не знаю. Він доложив, чи вважати, а ці вважають вже цьому опять Астахов, як директору. Він підходить, типу, говорить, треба з тобою поговорити типу, на серйозну тему. Типа заводи і в той же ж підвал, бере палку, яку нам там ще показують. Типа це яка палка будете получати, типа за ваші поступки, що ви чудите. Типа взяв і ударив по спині, вона прям синяк, вона мені показує, так прямо на всій спині. Він уже як появляється фіолетовий, вона типа дзвонить папі, жалується, реве, типа каже, що мені робити, він мене типа і обзиває, і б'є тут. This is psychological violence against children. And yet the laws of the world should punish them for violence against children. It's like raping a child. It's the same thing. Psychologically, it can be even worse, you know? These are the consequences that the whole world needs to understand who Russia is and what it is doing. Everything they do with Ukrainian children is not only abduction, it is sexual violence. Today we have 14 documented cases of sexual violence, among which the youngest victim is four years old.
We have killed children. We have wounded children. We have children from the Russians just shot for fun. And they did not give them back, did not allow anyone to enter the car with the shot children for two hours while they were still alive just enjoying the children's crying, wheezing and dying, and did not allow anyone to enter them. Only after two hours did they allow them in when the children were already dead. So what is this? This is nothing less than genocide. I had a camera on me, I had a young man, 24 years old, a young man. Його росіяни три дні катували, його катували струмом електричним, його дуже сильно били, там кастетами, прикладами, від автоматів, ногами били. Потім з нього ще, ну там зняли штани і потім його ще електрошокером його, ну, били там по геніталіям. Він після трьох днів він просто з'їхав з лукну. Спочатку він хотів повіститися в камері. Ось, ну, потім прийняв рішення таке, що, ну, як встріти собі ну, віни. І, ви знаєте, ми з ними спілкувалися, ну, як нічого не бувало. Я пам'ятаю його от очі, ну, от коли він там був. І, знаєте, коли він спочатку розмовляв, спілкувалися, а потім він там каже, що мені там було дуже, мені жарко зараз, мені так душно, дай води, будь ласка. Потім, коли ж він робив собі порізав, мені потрібно було прибирати кімнату, ну, ну, де він порізався. Я боявся вистрілу в пістолет, бо І там грали русську рулетку, на вас стріляли з закритими глазами. І кров бачив, коли в камеру затікало. Я боюся, що вернуться ці окупанти і заберуть мене знову. А найстрашніша картина, яка була, коли я зайшов в ту кімнату і до стелі, Руками був привішений людина, дротами була за руки підвішена. Мало того, що під цією людиною весь пол був завиткований. Так ще біля нього, знаєте, от таке стиба має вибинки від ну, таке відерце, може там десь на 500 мл на літр, і воно було от повністю так, знаєте, от залито кров'ю. І біля нього. Ну, в цій кімнаті там стояв стів і спокійно записував російські військові його показання. У цей момент ти не можеш показати ніяких емоцій. Десь один-два рази. Просто знаєте, як сльози тікли, але я прям такого не було. Бо у мене був дуже сильний, дуже-дуже сильний страх. Якщо побачите, що я плачу, вони можуть розуміти, що я зламався, що все. A rotten, vile army and society must always be maintained in a regular state of readiness for cruelty. And it is cruelty that is more complex in its functionality than aggression, because Aggression has its downsides, but cruelty sets a certain bar to which it even begins to pull aggression up, so that it is constantly mobilized. The immediate goal of all this is to reformat the consciousness of our children, in order to turn them into adherents of the Russian world. This methodology that they use with children is very similar to the principles of personality destruction through an institution like the Gulag. It's practically the same system, but it seems to take into account legal issues in order to avoid liability. But the very essence is the same, to break the personality. Then in Novozovsk, the doctors told me to take me to Donetsk. Це спустя місяць випросив телефон в одного хлопця і так швидко в туалеті подзвонив до бабусі і на одну хвилинку і розказав їй, де я знаходжусь. When I get a call from an unknown number on April 19th, I ask, who is it? Sasha says, grandma, come pick me up. I said, Sasha, I'll pick you up, my son. I'll pick you, just wait. Got the documents ready to go to him. They talked me out of it. Where are you going? They can close you and don't let you out. 
I said, how can I not go? My family Vlad is there. He's waiting for me. I will go, no matter what. In more than a year of full-scale war, Ukraine has managed to bring home less than 400 children. Diplomacy with the aggressor country is not working. Russia continues to abduct Ukrainian children. I started calling the camp director. He somehow managed to write. I said, Vitalik, give me the number of the director of the camp. I'll call her. I started a discussion with her and she was telling me, and how do I know that you're his mother? Maybe you're not his mom. I say, I don't get it. I'm his mother. I have the right, even if I can make it. You won't make it anyway. And she shuts down. That's it. They already knew I just couldn't take him. І цей директор лагеря до мене кожен день возмущалась, обзивала, каже, ти домой не вернешся, каже, даже не старайтесь, типа, каже, що там твоя мама, якщо на сьогодні прийде, поліцію визиваю, типа, і ФСБ буде тут, і все, каже, вам буде тут. They said that everybody gave you up, your parents are cowards and ran away, and you stay here under our care. I said, wait. I want to take my child. She says, what are you talking about? There are 300 people sitting here, and your 301st will sit here as well. The younger a child is, the more he or she needs another adult. When they are left without one, the child inevitably perceives it as a betrayal. Any other figure who starts to play the role of an assistant or just an adult in the child's environment inevitably becomes not so much an authority for him, but at least a figure he looks up to and begins to depend on emotionally, mentally and even literally physically. Therefore, of course, this is aimed at preparing such a new formation of Ukrainian children, but with a distorted consciousness. They improved their skills in, let's say, russifying Ukrainian children. They had the opportunity to practice on our children in Donbass and Crimea. They saw how one or another educational mechanism works, what children respond to better and in what circumstances. So they came to the conclusion, and it works, unfortunately, that when a child is without parents, without relatives, without proper support or in an environment that is unfamiliar to them, for example, the same health camps when there are only Russian-speaking people around, when there is only Russian propaganda around, when you have a Russian phone with the Russian SIM card, with the Russian internet, and any news that you watch is not there by chance, it is all intentional. And the child, while still in this environment, begins to believe what they are telling. I picked up the phone, you are contacted from the border, they told me so, your name is, said yes, did you write a power to attorney for, tell us your surname, first name, patronymic, what's your son's year of birth, I answered, and then she said, wait and meet your son soon. Коли вже приїхали ми додому, я плакав від радості, що я побачився з батьками, що я живий, здоровий, цілий. They arrived. It was happiness. I hugged my child, whom I hadn't seen for 10 days, and my brother. We had such emotions that we cried for each other with joy. I quickly took him and brought him back to my home. 
When children are returned, when we succeed in getting them back, an individual assessment of rehabilitation needs of each child take place. It is individual for each child, depending on age, on the territory from which they were abducted, whether it is a child who was taken away from his parents and allegedly taken on vacation, or a child whose mother or father died in front of him, and then he was abducted and could not communicate with his biological family at all. It all depends on individuals, so we do assessment of needs of each child, not just a psychological assessment. A medical examination is mandatory. If a child needs treatment, he or she is treated. Then their educational needs are assessed accordingly, as well as any humanitarian needs, ranging from the cell phone to clothes, because situations are different, and the actual psychological examination and testing is mandatory. And then it is determined what a particular child needs, how long the rehabilitation will last. Of course, there may be, so to speak, rehabilitation after all this and a person a child can be brought back to a certain norm but we all understand that it will never be the same as before the war never the same as before captivity and before abduction that is this is another option in which we have to look for our own norm of life Але от знаєте, серце вроде би, ну, розуміє, що ти зараз звільнений, все добре, але мозок це не відпускає. Я повністю переосмислив життя, повністю переосмислив цінність життя. І я осмислив те, що яка б ситуація важка не була, з неї можна вийти. In fact, there is no single mechanism, no single algorithm for the return of Ukrainian children. Those procedures that should work in theory have not worked in practice. For example, the International Committee of the Red Cross has the largest mandate in this matter. It hasn't worked out. That is why today we understand that the return procedure is so slow. As of today, there are 369 children returned home. This is because every time it is almost a separate operation to rescue a child or a small group of children. That is why it is so slow. So now, by creating new algorithms with Ukrainian children, new mechanisms for return by searching for these opportunities, by involving the entire international community in the search for these ways out. We are actually doing this not only for Ukrainian children, but for every child in the world, because we are building a new global system of security for the world's children. In my opinion, we need to create a real, functioning international system that will respond to this. If a state allows itself to commit an act of aggression against another state, kill children, rape children, deport children, the system should respond quickly in the form of a complete blockade of economic activity with that country, diplomatic and any military assistance. That is, it should work. Now is a very important moment to prepare national legislation and ratify a number of international conventions on the protection of children's rights to minimize the consequences of the crisis, abduction and illegal deportation of children. Because this is not deportation, Russia says, it is abduction, and we need to say in clear terms in European countries, at the PASSE, the Council of Europe, the UN, that this is abduction. Because deportation is a rather legal word, not a criminal word, like the whole country that does this kind of thing. Therefore, in my opinion, the ratification of the Hague Convention could give us some results now. Now we have only one goal. This is the return of children through the negotiation process and verification of where these children are, because the main problem is that we don't know where Ukrainian children are being hidden in Russia. The entire democratic world understands that Russia's abduction of our children is a genocide of the Ukrainian people. The warrant issued by the International Criminal Court in The Hague for the arrest of Putin and Russian's ombudsperson for the children's rights Maria Lvova-Belova 
mark the beginning of a historic responsibility to which all those involved will be held accountable and Ukrainian children will definitely return home because they are loved and waited for here. Indeed, we must all fight so that the whole world knows the truth about what is being done to our children. This is the most urgent topic that can touch every heart on earth. Потрібно якомога швидше закінчувати цю війну. In every one of our Ukrainian lands, wherever you have been, with your foot you have stepped, with your hand you have touched, you must get shot ten times a day. Ten times, night and day, until you turn to ashes. For all our children. None of your crimes will be hidden. You will be held accountable for everything. No child should feel what our children are feeling now, without access to their parents, without access to their native language, without access to everything that was familiar to them. This should not happen, and you will be held accountable for everything. He is not even worthy of being addressed after what he has done for his own benefit for the sake of some office or power, he is ready to transgress and will transgress the most sacred. These are children. I have no one to turn to. He does not exist for me. A country that will never be friendly. A country that is put by Ukraine on every blacklist for the rest of its days. A country that will not be a country for as long as Ukraine will let it. And until every child is returned to the country, no Ukrainian will forgive you. Repent. We will do our best to ensure that every Ukrainian child can return home to Ukraine, to their city, to their yard, where their father's fairy tale and mother's lullaby will not be heard via video. We want it to be live, where it is safe, where it is free and peaceful, and therefore, where it is Ukraine. It's terrible when children tell how the Russian military treated them during their captivity. We also have such children, Vlad, who was held captive for 90 days, Vitali, who was held captive by the Russians for 10 days, who tell terrible things, Vitali, who says that now he can take a shower because he can't put his feet in the wet or when his feet are just wet, because he remembers falling asleep in his cell and waking up from a shot and then realizing that his feet were wet for some reason and it was the blood of a man who was killed in the neighboring cell. It had flowed under the door and soaked his feet. Vlad, who collected the teeth of our prisoners in the torture chambers. And it is terrible. Sasha, an eight-year-old girl who had her leg amputated after a rocket exploded and has returned to gymnastics, says, look how I can do it now with the prosthesis and it doesn't hurt at all. Is it possible you choose among other griefs the grief that touches you the most? They are children, children's eyes, children's voices. It's terrible that there are a lot of children's voices that will never sound again. This is the worst thing. That's why I want them to continue telling their stories and let the whole world know about them.
і на оновленій землі врага не буде супостата, і буде син, і буде мати, і будуть люди на землі.